I don't get personal with y'all on this show very often, but one question I get asked a lot is simply, Eric, how did you get into NASCAR in the first place? And you know, I've always thought about it and you know, I don't come from a family of you know, lifelong race fans. I got my dad into NASCAR. And so ever since I started publishing NASCAR related content to YouTube, that's the perspective I've been coming from. That's the question I've been trying to answer. How can we make NASCAR more interesting, more entertaining, more engaging to kids and adults who know nothing about it? I was recently visiting my parents and I came across some old photos and it got me thinking, maybe I should just make a video where I share my story of how I became a NASCAR fan. And perhaps many of you out there will be able to relate to it in some way or another. And at the end of this video, I wanna hear your stories as well. So sit back, relax, and let's take a trip down memory lane. How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric, and welcome to a special episode of Out of the Groove, presented by Jockey. You may have noticed I'm wearing this extremely comfortable, premium cotton made in America Jockey t-shirt. Made from cotton grown and sewn in the United States, the all new Jockey made in America tee is the most comfortable t-shirt you'll ever wear. It's lightweight, it's comfortable, it fits great. And remember, anytime you support Jockey, you're supporting American workers who've been crafting comfort Americans have trusted since 1876. There's only one Jockey. Jockey is also the sponsor of the upcoming Road America NASCAR Cup Series event, the Jockey Made in America 250. I'll be there in person, I cannot wait. Thank you to Jockey for keeping me comfortable and supporting the show and supporting NASCAR. So this is my how I became a NASCAR fan story. Just for your information, I'm 23 years old now. I've been a NASCAR fan since I was about six years old. That's when I first saw NASCAR on TV, at least that I remember. And I remember thinking before then that race cars weren't a real thing. I'd seen like Hot Wheels TV shows and they're doing like loop-de-loops and catching on fire and stuff. I thought race cars were all make-believe, you know? And then when I saw NASCAR on TV, I, I couldn't believe it. I vividly remember watching a race with my dad. I think it was at Pocono, and I only say that because I remember a lot of green, like trees and stuff on screen. And I remember watching one guy go to the inside and make a pass in the corner. It was a pretty simple, straightforward NASCAR pass. And my dad said, wow, that is amazing that they're able to do that at those speeds. And that stuck with me because he wasn't a NASCAR fan. I wasn't a NASCAR fan. Heck, I just realized that race cars were a real thing. Something about my dad sitting on his couch providing that added layer of commentary somehow made watching a simple pass for position on the racetrack seem like one of the coolest things I had ever seen at that point in my life. I was hooked. And not long after, I got my first ever NASCAR video game, NASCAR Thunder 2004, a classic. Look at the shock and awe in young Eric's face. I love those old EA Sports NASCAR video games. I played a ton of NASCAR Thunder 2004. I skipped a couple years there. The next NASCAR game I bought was NASCAR 07 and I played a ton of that as well. I had them both for the PS2. I had a steering wheel set up and everything. I went all out. I remember one time, this sounds really stupid now, but I'd set up like the steering wheel on like a tray table in the middle of the living room. I'd put a, bring, like, a kitchen chair over to like sit behind it and work it. And then I'd bring a fan and I'd put that between me and the TV, have it blow in my face like I don't know for added effect so I was driving the car and getting blasted with air like I was racing a convertible or something I, I was all about that 4d all around you experience I vividly remember pulling up the main menu seeing Elliot Sadler's face looking back at me for whatever reason and hearing breaking Benjamin's the diary of Jane blasting through my TV speakers good times good times you know as a little kid sometimes because late soon after I became a big Matt Kenseth fan I would drive the wrong way around the track and I would intentionally try to wreck every car in the field except Matt Kenseth. I'd try to keep my boy Matt safe. It usually didn't work out. I was a I was an aggressive child. But anyway, anyway, the point of me talking about NASCAR Thunder 2004 is I believe having a great console video game is instrumental to reaching younger fans. No disrespect to the NASCAR Heat series, there have been some solid games the last few years, but when compared to other AAA racing titles like Forza or even Need for Speed or Project Cars, heck, even the F1 video games the last few years, the NASCAR Heat series just don't hold a candle to them. NASCAR is missing out on a huge opportunity to reach younger audiences. I don't think I'd be as big a NASCAR fan as I am today if I hadn't been hooked by NASCAR Thunder 2004 and some of the other early EA Sports titles. There's a lot riding, in my opinion, on the next console release, which is said to be in the works, might come out later this year or next year. Hopefully also for next-gen consoles, you know, the PlayStation 5, the Xbox Series X, whatever they're called. NASCAR needs a console game that can hold its own against other AAA racing titles. And honestly, that's not something they've had since 
maybe inside line in 2012. That game at least had really cool car customization options. Anyway, video games were key, but another part of my childhood that helped foster the NASCAR fan within me was collecting and playing with NASCAR diecast toys. This was the first diecast I ever remember owning. You can see it in my hand there, the number 36 M&Ms. I believe that's a Ken Schrader car. That was the first diecast I remember owning, but as a kid, I had a ton. I would take them to the playground. I think I remember trading, I don't know, something probably really cool for a Matt Kenseth diecast one of my friends had. That's right, I had friends in elementary school that were trading diecasts with me like they were Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Man, those were the days. But needless to say, playing with Hot Wheels cars when I was really young was my favorite. Thing, playing with NASCAR diecast once I once I started to amass a collection of those was equally my thing and that's part of why when I began posting NASCAR related content on YouTube you'll remember a lot of my videos involved NASCAR diecasts and stop-motion animations and things like that with them so still to this day I collect NASCAR diecasts big and small but boy I think they played a huge huge role in growing my interest in the sport at a young young age and speaking of kids on the playground trading diecasts that also reminds me back in I think second grade I actually have the box right here. Yes, second grade. When I was bored during class, like I'd finished my work or something, I was just sitting there twiddling my thumbs. I would draw on blank sheets of notebook paper, like oval racetracks. And then I would like take different colored, like colored pencils, like a red one and a blue one. And I would like race them sort of around the track. I don't know, just pretending them that they were cars. I just like trace them. And I'd be like, oh, he made a pass, blah, blah, blah. That's what I was doing as a kid. And at some point me and some of the other kids in the class began like associating each other with different colors. Like, I don't remember specifically like I was the blue color, my friend James was red, Spencer was green, whatever the case may be. And so when we were bored, we'd race these different colors and whichever color we had win, we would then draw these trophies and go give them to the kid who won. And yes, I was at my parents' house recently and I found some of these trophies. I still have them taped up in my school box. Look at these, first place. <laughs> this was incredible. Look, it's even got the cowboy boots like for Texas Motor Speedway's trophy. We were, we were on it, we were big fans. It sounds cheesy now, but what are you gonna do when you're seven years old? and there's nothing else to do but eat animal crackers. So video games, diecast cars, those were huge in turning me into a NASCAR fan, but so was going to a race in person. And this is why I tell people all the time, how do I get my friends into NASCAR? Some people leave comments on my videos, how do I get my girlfriend or something into, the, into racing? And I say, hey, if you can, if you have the means, if you have the ability to take them to a race in person. I went to my first NASCAR race in the fall of 2005. It was the Dickies 500 at Texas Motor Speedway. And I recently found a lot of photos that I, probably my dad took at this race. Look at me, look at me, a little, little, little kid. I'm so this is the smallest I've ever been. Obviously this was Texas Motor Speedway in the mid 2000s. There were easily 130, 140,000 people at the track that weekend. You're not gonna get that kind of crowd at many NASCAR races these days, but there's still a spectacle in just the scale alone. Even the short tracks like Bristol, Martinsville, the venues are massive, colossal. Tens of thousands of people still flock to these racetracks week in, week out. And not to mention the race cars themselves knock you out of your seat. <laughs> I was feeling kind of sick actually that first race I ever went to. I remember I I'd lost my voice. I was probably even slightly feverish, but I still remember those race cars rocketing by the front stretch for the first time. That shook me to my core. The roar of the fans, the roar of the engines, the intensity you feel in the grandstands at one of these races. I still feel that to this day, no matter if I'm on pit road or in the grandstands still. NASCAR has changed a lot in 15 years, but one thing that hasn't is the incredible experience of feeling the entire pack thunder on by at full speed. It's something I'll never really get tired of. I remember a lot about that race actually. Carl Edwards won, got to see him do a backflip. Interestingly enough, I also saw Carl Edwards' last win, also came at Texas in 2016. I remember my boy Matt Kenseth started on pole because I think Ryan Newman failed inspection or had to go to a backup car. Matt Kenseth led the most laps in the race and finished third, so I was, I was a pretty happy camper at the end of the day. And I remember traffic being horrible because they had not yet expanded the freeways around Texas Motor Speedway, it was rough. I love that NASCAR has made such an initiative in the last few years to get more, especially younger fans out to the racetrack. For the longest time, kids had free admission to many Xfinity and Truck Series races. It honestly may still be that way. I'm not sure, they don't advertise it as much, but it may still be the case at many tracks. I think that's brilliant. I think that's genius. And I hope they continue to make efforts to, to make kids enjoy themselves more at races. When I was at COTA a couple weeks ago, they had a lot of carnival rides, things for the kids to do outside the track. Hopefully that helped attract some families and hopefully other tracks 
racetracks continue to do similar things because bringing kids or any new fan, any potential new fan to a racetrack during a race weekend is sure to leave quite the lasting impression on them. And I think usually it'll be a very positive impression. Now I've talked a lot about how I became a NASCAR fan, but the truth is for many, many years, I was kind of a NASCAR fan second. First and foremost, I was a Matt Kenseth fan. Everyone's had a favorite driver at some point or another. Even if your favorite driver, Dale Earnhardt Jr. or Jeff Gordon retired and you've never found someone quite to the same level, everyone watching this has had a favorite driver at some point. And to me, I think that's the fourth important pillar in creating new NASCAR fans. They gotta have someone to root for. They gotta have someone that they're attached to, that they can relate to, someone that they can support, they can cheer when they do well, they can boo or oh shucks when they do bad. Something or someone to keep fans emotionally invested in the outcome of the race. So I became a Matt Kenseth fan, uh, technically, I guess around 2004, like not long after I became a NASCAR fan, because pretty quickly, pretty early on, I, when I was playing the NASCAR Thunder video games, I was attracted to the black and yellow Matt Kenseth DeWalt paint scheme. Thought it looked really sharp, black and yellow. I don't know, I like Batman. Maybe the black and yellow made me think of Batman. I was like, oh, it's the Batmobile. I, I was a dumb kid, who knows? So needless to say, I spent a lot of time racing as him in that game, but I didn't know anything about Matt Kenseth's personality, his previous success until my family visited my mom's old friend from like high school, one of her best friends, I guess, back in the day. We were visiting them out in Atlanta, Georgia, I believe. And I remember going into this woman's house and seeing on her refrigerator uh, a newspaper clipping that had been cut out. And it was a photo of Matt Kenseth hoisting the 2003 Winston Cup Championship trophy. Now I was a NASCAR expert at this point. You know, I'd spent hours upon hours playing NASCAR Thunder 2004. So I immediately identified that as Matt Kenseth the protagonist of that video game I'd been obsessed with. And so I asked, I was like, whoa, well, that's Matt Kenseth, well, who, why, why, why? And that's when I became aware that this woman was actually a distant relative of Matt Kenseth, you know, like third cousin, something like that. And I remember she showed me her younger son who was a little older than me at the time, his bedroom, and it was coated with Matt Kenseth stuff. I, I remember, he, I think he had like a, a rear deck or a rear bumper, like sheet metal, like up above his bed, DeWalt. I was so jealous even at the time. I'm still jealous to this day, my goodness. And that was the moment I decided I'm gonna follow this Matt Kenseth fella and see how he does. Clearly he must be pretty good if he's holding a big trophy in that newspaper clipping. So hopefully this doesn't let me down. I started watching Matt Kenseth very closely there. That was the end of 2004 into 2005. You can see photos of like my seventh birthday party. Look at this epic cake my parents got for me. They went all out for this thing. Look at that, Matt Kenseth and Mark Martin. I like how it's Pfizer car, not the Viagra car. Might have been a little weird at a you know, seven year old's birthday party. But that's when I began following Matt Kenseth. I always respected his ability to just block out a lot of the noise, usually, stay away from most of the drama, usually, and just go get the best results each and every week. I always respected that. And so, well, while at first it was purely superficial reasons to like Matt Kenseth, I mean, it was really, I just liked the paint scheme he drove. That turned into something more. That turned into a rooting vested interest in someone's personality, their on track style, to the point where when Matt Kenseth won his final race in 2017, I was in college in my dorm room. I shed real tears watching that race in real time. That's like the only time I've ever cried ride, I think during or about a sporting event. It was the culmination of many, many years of supporting that guy, whatever he did on the track, I was emotionally invested. So if we're talking about ways to attract new fans into NASCAR, we gotta hit on all four of those pillars. I think a video game, especially for younger fans, is crucial. A very good, a well-made, AAA level video game is key. iRacing and stuff is great, but that's way more expensive than a $50, $60 console game. Diecast cars, toys and stuff in are collectibles. I think we could broaden that to just collectibles. Collectibles are key. Thirdly, you gotta go to a race. I mean, kudos to the people who are big racing fans who've never been to a NASCAR race, because I know there are many of you out there. That's awesome that you've been, been so engaged with the sport, only seeing it on TV and on social media and stuff. But to me, if you want to attract lifelong fans, you got to get them out to the racetrack. So any initiative that brings more fans out to the racetrack or brings the racing, brings the track to the fans, a la Chicago Street Course, I'm a huge fan of. That fourth pillar, you got to have drivers that are relatable. You got to have drivers that fans can pick and choose, can get behind, can emotionally invest in. And right now, I think some of the younger, newer drivers are starting to do a better job of that. But for a few years there, it was kind of... Ugh. 
goes dry. Anything that highlights driver personality, even if maybe it's a little controversial at times, I think that's a good thing. That's why I support drivers like Noah Gregson, who's often controversial, often ruffling feathers, but I also support drivers like Eric Jones, who doesn't really ruffle anyone's feathers. He just goes out there and does his thing each week. You know, I, I support both sides of the spectrum because I think fans should have the chance to choose the driver that relates most closely to them. I think Kyle Busch is great for the sport because he's a hero to many and he's a villain to even more. That makes for a great story. Stories are what keep people engaged. But that's it, that's how I became a NASCAR fan. I mean, throughout the mid 2000s and late 2000s, you know, I went to the Brickyard 400 one year. That was really, really cool to see that historic track in person. I remember in, I think it was sixth grade, maybe seventh grade, there was a project where we had to pick from a list of famous people and we had to like give a presentation, give a speech to like the entire sixth or seventh grade class as that famous person. Like you dress up as them and everything. And I remember looking at the list and it was, you know, George Washington, Martin Luther King Jr., Amelia Earhart, you know, famous historical figures. And he got down to athletes and I was like, oh, Babe Ruth, that's pretty cool. Tom Brady, all right. And then I saw Matt Kenseth's name on the list. I couldn't believe it. So I did my project as Matt Kenseth. This was when he was driving the Crown Royal car. I couldn't wear, you know, Crown Royal shirt to, you know, middle school. I, I'm pretty sure they had a rule against alcohol. <laughs> I should have just worn DeWalt stuff. People would have gotten the point. But no, this is what I looked like. I can't find the video. My mom, I think, filmed it because I think parents were there too. I wish I could find the video. It went pretty well, I remember. I got a really good grade on it. People were interested in my Matt Kenseth speech, but goodness me, what a, what a look that was. <laughs> I just printed logos onto sheets of paper and taped them to my shirt, oh my gosh. But needless to say, my NASCAR fandom uh, took on many appearances throughout the years. Now I host a YouTube show where I talk racing day in, day out, and it's uh, a dream job at this point. And that's thanks to all of your incredible support. I hope you all enjoyed hearing my story. Now I wanna hear your NASCAR fan story, whether it was how you got into NASCAR in the first place, or maybe one of your most fond memories of being a race fan. Leave a comment down below or tweet at me using the hashtag MyNASCARFanStory. I'll be checking through all of them, reading all of them, commenting, replying, all that great stuff, because I wanna hear some positive NASCAR stories from all of you guys. Y'all are incredible. Thank you so much for watching this sort of different style episode. Thank you again to Jockey for once again, keeping me comfortable, helping me look good and clean on camera. I will see you in the next one. Have a fantastic rest of your day.